here we are, high on the southwest ridge of Mount Aspiring, New Zealand. Wait a minute, I'll clip you in. Just give me a minute. Okay, you're safe now. Sit down, but wait, you might feel a little queasy, so don't look down too quickly, all right? So remember where you are, you're high on the slopes of a mountain. Is anybody feeling slightly afraid? I think maybe you are. You see, what I'm going to talk about today is that we're going to go on a journey together. We're actually going today to deconstruct fear. What does that mean, to deconstruct fear? Well, first of all, let, you, let me tell you a little bit about me, who's going to take you on that journey today. So, DK introduced me as a fear wrangler. Well, actually I'm an adventure coach because I found the other title didn't really pull the clients very well. <laughs> so, I learn from adventure and I love working with others who love to face life. And I have, if you like, a, a series of alpine or other laboratories and I'm going to just introduce you to those now. The first laboratory is my high altitude laboratory. This is the view from the tent at 7,100 metres. Or this laboratory, which is out on my sea level kayak. Five days gear, heading out into the beautiful Marlborough Sounds. And finally, my mobile laboratory. This was me last weekend, in fact, at the Round Lake Taipo cycle race. 153 kilometres of backside breaking sea of lycra. You know that woman with the ask me sign? I should have said to her, why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, if we were to have a section in our resume, in our CV, that said fear, what would yours look like? Mine would be quite impressive. It would start with something like afraid of spiders. Would move on quickly and of something of a crescendo to gripped and running to the toilet while looking up at what she's about to climb. Or second bullet. Shaking and senseless after swimming across a flooded river in the Solomon Islands. Third bullet. Breathing and waking, unable to breathe, on the sixth highest mountain in the world. I think you're getting a beginning to get a flavour of it, yes? The thing is, fear is something we don't run toward, is it? It's something we resist, we medicate, we move away from, we don't want. And we certainly don't want to tell other people that we're afraid. So today... We're going to take a close look at that. You know, for me, I have to admit that actually this was an unexpected adventure. A little bit like certain hobbits and Bilbo that's very popular right now in this coolest little capital in, New in the world. <laughs> so like that, this is somewhat of an unexpected adventure for me. You see, I thought I could come up here and talk about the science of fear talk about the neuroscience even, which I know quite a lot about. I thought then I'd spice it up with a few stories. And finally, that I'd be able to move quickly to overcoming fear, which is much more comfortable terrain. Well, what actually happened is a little bit different. It's a journey that I want to take you on now, if you're willing to come. So let's start, if you like, on some moderate ground some easy country. Let's talk a little bit about adventure. I love adventures and many of you may love adventures too. And I don't just mean adventures in the outdoors and mountains or on the river. I mean an adventure could be anything, any undertaking, where the outcome is uncertain. Could be as something like looking for your keys in the morning on the way to work or it could be starting a new job, 
moving to a new city. It could be an adventure you don't want called that phone call when they're ringing to say you have melanoma cancer. There are many kinds of adventures. Some we want, some we don't. And this is when I want us to move a little to the next ground, if you like, the foothills of our journey together today, where I say to you, so maybe think about something, just a little, a little something that you are afraid of. It makes you feel just a little bit afraid. Think about what that is. Now, for some of you, what that will mean is that you've got, your heart will be beating a little bit more, your eyes might be slightly wider, you might have even sat up in your chair a little bit. Because that's what enabling fear does for us at a conscious level. There's a lot happening subconsciously, but at a conscious level that's what happens. So, in fact, it's helpful to us, this kind of fear. It's enabling. But for some of you, I suspect, as soon as I use the word fear, you didn't choose a little thing. You went straight to a big thing. And you probably haven't heard anything that I've said for at least the last minute or two. Yeah? That is disabling fear. And that is when our system has taken over and we are no longer in control. We're going to talk some more about that down the track. But before we do, I want to move to much more challenging terrain for us. I want to tell you about fear up close and personal. And this is my story. We're going to wind back the clock to the 9th of November 2011, around about a year ago. I was embarking upon this mission called Cook to Cook. What is it? Well, we were going to climb this mountain in the, the picture you can see, it's New Zealand's highest mountain, Mount Cook. We were then going to cycle the 700 kilometres from Mount Cook to the top of the South Island in Picton, and then kayak across the wild and dangerous Cook Strait, Cook to Cook. That was our mission. So we were on top of Mount Cook, in fact, at 3 p.m. on that day. I should have felt elated, but actually I just felt tired and cold and screaming to get down. We'd spent hours making our way up the slopes, very, very steep, icy terrain. As we went, the weather was deteriorating significantly much more than the forecast had ever indicated. This is the view that you should get on the top of Mount Cook. I know, I'd been there a few times before. This was the view we got. The weather was hideous, was unbelievably cold. And you can see there that I'm trying to get water out of my drinking system, which even though it was inside my pack, was completely and utterly frozen. I'd not had a drop to drink for hours. I was desperately thirsty. And it was cold. Very cold. My hands, unfortunately, got cold trying to get water out of there. And I knew we were in trouble. We headed down, trying to get out of the storm. But as darkness came, we realised that, in fact, we were going to have to stay overnight in a snow hole. We dug the snow hole. This is my climbing partner and I. And as we dug it, I thought, gee, that looks like a coffin. But I didn't say anything. We tried to start get the stove lit to, to light, but actually it wouldn't light. Those conditions were just so unbelievably bad. So we just got into our bivvy bags and lay down and tried to get some sleep. We knew it was going to be a nasty night. Little did we know how nasty it would get. I'd just lain down when I heard a sound from above. It's a sound that you never want to hear. It was whoomph. It was an avalanche. Within moments, I didn't even have a chance to move. Within moments, the snow was cascading down onto my prone body, pinning me to the floor of that icy hole. I couldn't actually move either. I'd put my hand against my face 
but in fact the snow just came straight through it. This is the face of desperation. I knew that I would have a limited amount of oxygen in there, a very limited amount, and I didn't know what had happened to my climbing partner. I called out to her, where are you, where are you? And heard silence, nothing, no hope. You know, it's still quite hard to talk about these moments. But something strange happened as well. You would expect that I might have thought of loved ones, that there might have been a slow motion movie playing of my life, or something, maybe light or a tunnel. But no, what I thought of was a story I'd heard of two, two blokes caught in an avalanche. One man panicked, used all his oxygen and died. The second man in the same avalanche stayed calm, saved his oxygen and was dug out alive. I remembered this story in the midst of this terrible suffocation and I decided to panic. <laughs> <laughs> it was all I could do. And in fact, it turned out to be life-saving, actually, in my case. Because just as I was using up my last breath of air, and my mind was going black, not enough oxygen, I heard a small noise, a scratching noise. And then I heard a voice saying, where are you, where's your face? It was my climbing partner, Cat. Her hands came through the snow and this massive hand pulled across my face and I gasped in the breath of my life. That life and that breath was salvation. It was hope. It was a precious second chance at life. It was something, a moment I will never, ever forget. It turned out that my climbing partner, Kat, had been standing up when the avalanche hit. She managed to, through the force of the snow coming over her, she managed to stand up and was buried up to her chest in snow. With her bare hands, she then dug through the snow to save my life. We dug ourselves out over the next short period and realised that we needed to move because where we were was a death trap. We started shifting, moving down the hill, down the mountain, and I said to Kat, be careful, there are other crevasses, don't step into one. You know, we've survived one thing, let's not die now. As I said it, her foot went through a massive hole. And I went, oh no, it's not over. It's like one of those bad horror movies. But as she put her foot through the crevasse, she said to me, hang on a minute, I think we can actually go in here and shelter. You can imagine how excited I was about going <laughs> down underneath the snow. It took her quite a while to demonstrate the facilities available. <laughs> but we did shelter there. We shook. We cried. We realised, at least I cried, we realised that we had got very close. The next morning dawned a beautiful day and we looked back. You know an X on a picture is never a good thing? We looked back to where our snow hole had been. We looked at the crevasse above it, which was a gaping crevasse the size of this room the night before. It had filled in completely almost. We would have been dead if we'd been in there. We looked back and realised that that was our place where life started for me. So the damage that we sustained, unfortunately, from that journey, and particularly to the hands, and particularly to my climbing partner's hands, meant that we had to abandon um, our cook-to-cook -cook mission at that time. But I'll tell you what, and now would be a good time to do this. You know, let's all take a deep breath of air. Because I suspect that some of you may have been holding your breath, yeah? This is what happens when we're afraid, we hold our breath. But do you know, to breathe in deeply 
is actually to inspire. We breathe in, we inspire. And with that deep breath that I took in those dreadful moments, that was life, that was inspiration for me. And when I took that deep breath of air, three things happened. I brought oxygen to a severely starved brain of oxygen, giving me life, giving me clarity, giving me the ability to think. Second thing was I got a pause. A deep breath in will give you that. It gives you a moment to pause, to stop. And then it gives you the third thing, and that is the ability to actually be with what's going on, to be in the moment. You see, that's what inspiration is. A sense of oxygen, a sense of clarity, a sense of pause, and a sense of seeing things the way they really are. You see, maybe we can deconstruct fear to one single thing, a deep breath in. Could it be that simple? Well, actually, in many years of adventuring, of climbing all over the world, of bringing myself to some pretty fearful situations, I'm beginning to think it's the key. Why? Because maybe we get to look at fear through a pinhole, through a tiny little glass. We get to see it for what it really is. We get to see that maybe it's not quite what we thought. Maybe it's not that thing to push away. But maybe, in fact, as Pema Chodron would say, fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. So it might not be that Rottweiler we think it is. It might just be a Chihuahua with a large shadow. <laughs> so my encouragement to you is inspire yourself. I'm going back to the cook to cook in about a month's time. We're gonna go back and do it and face our fears. I encourage you to face your fears, inspire yourself, breathe, and go to the summits of your life. Thank you very much.